John chapter 15, John chapter 15. Now before we do, before we get to where we're going in our, our verses today, uh, if you weren't here last week, uh, you missed a treat. Uh, uh, Don Schenkel, he uh, preached for me. We have been blessed here with great men of God, prophets of God, uh, that speak forth the mind of God, and we have been blessed, whether it be Jason the week before, Don last week. But a funny thing happened last week to me. I'll be honest with you, I don't normally do this, but as I was listening to Don preach last week, uh, something hit me. In fact, I, I'm, uh, God gave me this sermon last week while Don was preaching. You're saying, well, Randy, what in the world did Don say that just lit you up, that got you so excited, that put a sermon in your heart? Well, let me play the clip. Go ahead and play the clip. Let me help you understand what Jesus set you free from. He set you free from the power of sin in your lives. Amen? He broke that chain. He broke that bondage, okay? And he sets you free. And so now, on this side over here, now you become a slave to righteousness, okay? And you can become a slave to righteousness because you get filled with the Holy Spirit. And righteousness means what? Doing right, right? And we know that we're going to do right when what? we will let the Holy Spirit guide and lead and direct our lives, amen? Okay? So now, I know that I was a victim to this power of sin, and really I was a victim myself, uh, I, I want to do good, but I can't do good, and, and I'm, I'm crying out. I need somebody to help me, and I know Jesus can be the one to do that. And so what i got to realize is the reason why I had all these issues in my life is because me making my own choices, me making my own decisions, me doing what I think is right. But that never worked out, does it? So I know I need something else to help me out, and that's what the Holy Spirit is going to do for us. So every day I simply just do what the Holy Spirit tells me to do. And I know that if I will do exactly what the Holy Spirit tells me to do, that I'll always be doing what's right. Okay? Here's what's cool about that. That takes all the work out for me. That's the freest you can be. I no longer have to worry about making choices or decisions or doing right or doing wrong or the things that I want to do that I don't want to do and all this different stuff. I simply let God lead my life and everything's exactly the way it's supposed to be. Don't you want to live that way? Don't you want to have that type of freedom? Yes. That takes all the stupid out of it. And I got a whole bunch of it, so I, I need all the help I can get. But that's what he's saying. So you become a slave to righteousness. You become a slave to God. But basically, you become a slave to doing what it is that you're supposed to do. And that sets you free. Now, when that was going on, man, my, my, my head was rolling. My head was just exploding with all his thoughts. And, and I guess the best way to explain what was going through my head, it was, like, it was like Don was talking about living in the sweet spot. Living in the sweet. Do you know what I mean by that? Have you ever had one of those days where you you spent the whole day in the sweet spot? You 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 didn't say too much, but you didn't say too little. Uh, uh, you you didn't do too much, but you didn't do too little. You were where you were supposed to be. You went where you were supposed to go. You were you were who you were supposed to be. You lived in the sweet spot, and then when you got down to the end of the day, you were fall asleep at night, you may have even heard like I have several times, God whisper into your head, well done, good and faithful servant. You ever had one of those days? And then what happens? The next day you wake up and you screw it all up. <laughs> right? That's my life right there. And, and as he was preaching last week, I was going, okay, he's talking about freedom. I'm like, I want that freedom. He's talking about living in the sweet spot. I'm like, I want that. And he gave us some stuff that we had to know that if you don't know, you need to go back and listen to that message. Because there's certain, God first starts in our head before he changes anything else. And he gave us some key essentials of what we had to know if we're going to live in the sweet spot. But then as I was thinking, and I promise you, I did get back to listening. But as I was sitting there, the, the thing that went through my head was how. How do I get that? How do I live in that sweet spot every day? How do I do like what he was talking about where I just listen to the Holy Spirit all day? I don't sin. And I live in obedience and I get to the end of the day and he says, well done. Because guess what? If you have enough days of those days, if you have enough times like those times, that's how when you get to heaven, that's how when you get to glory, you hear him say what? Well done good and faithful service. And I have yet to meet even people that don't even go to church tell me that, Pastor, I want to hear the Lord say, well done. So how do we get that? And so I do like I always did. I made a mental note and then I went to my prayer closet when I got home and I was like, God, how? How can we get to that point 
where we're living in the sweet spot. We're living, we're, we're going where we're supposed to go. We're doing what we're supposed to do. We're being who we're supposed to be. How do I get that? And he brought us to our book in John, beautiful gospel of John, chapter 15. So read with me if you would. John chapter 15, beginning with verse 5. And Jesus says this. This is Jesus talking. It's red letters in my Bible. I don't know about yours. But Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse 5, he says, Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Now, if you're going to understand those verses, we got to figure out what he means by fruit. Is he talking about apples? Is he talking about oranges? What's he talking about there when he's talking about fruit, that, that Victor has got to bear much fruit if he's going to live in the sweet spot of life? What does he mean by fruit? Well, let me give you the definition of biblical fruit. The definition of biblical fruit is this, a good heart that results in good words and actions. A good heart that results in good words and actions. We see it in Philippians 1.11 where he talks about the heart. He says, May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. You see it? He's talking about a good heart there. How do we get that heart? It's given to us by Jesus Christ. But then he also says, not just, he doesn't stop there. In Titus 3.14 he says, Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so that they will not be unfruitful. So what do we see there? Let me simplify it even further. Fruit equals good works from a good heart. When you read in the Bible, it says you've got to bear a lot of fruit. 30, 60, 100 fold it talks about sometimes. When he talks about fruit, he's saying that you've got to have good works that come from a good heart. And he's saying if you want to live in the sweet spot today, if Drew Garrett wants to wake up on Monday of all days and have one of those abundant life days where when he lays down at night that night, he hears God say, well done, good and faithful service, then Drew Garrett has got to do what? He's got to bear much fruit. And we are all the same way. You're saying, well, Randy, how do I do that? Again, we're back to the how. How do we bear much fruit? How do we live in the sweet lot each day? Well, Jesus told us in our verses today, and we see, first of all, this. If we want to live in the sweet spot, if we want to bear much fruit, then we must remain in his presence. We must remain in Jesus's presence. Go back to verse 5. He says, those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Fruit. What's he doing? He's giving us the first step. You want to have a great day today? You want to have a great week this week? The first step is this. We've got to live with an undeniable awareness of God's presence all the time. You might want to write that down. If we want to live in the sweet spot, you've got to live with an undeniable awareness of Jesus' presence all the time. You see, throughout the day, we've got to know and we've got to live like Jesus is right with us. Wherever we go, whatever we do, Jesus is there. No matter how far we travel from home, no matter how far we travel from the church, Jesus is there. You're saying, well, Randy, I don't know about that. You, you know where I work? Randy, you know who I live with? I don't know if Jesus is there. He's here. I can feel him. But is he there? Well, that leads me to a, a fact that just frustrates me. And the fact is this. Most Christians deny the miracle of their salvation. Most Christians deny the miracle of their salvation. You see, we're like the disciples in Mark 6, 52. It says, they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. He's talking about the miracle of feeding 5,000. They didn't understand it. Why? Their hearts were too hard to take it in. And like the disciples, most of us live in denial. We live in denial. We deny the miracle of our salvation. If you truly are saved today, then the Bible says you have experienced the greatest miracle of all. You're saying, Randy, what's that miracle? Well, Colossians 1, 12, 127 tells us the secret of our salvation is this. Christ lives in you. Galatians 2.20 keeps going, and it says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. 
That's the greatest miracle of all. You get that, right? Feeding 5,000 people is not that big a deal. Walking on water, not that big a deal. Healing the blind, not that big a deal. The greatest miracle of all is Jesus Christ living in us and through us. And that's the miracle of your salvation. Yet you're saying, Randy, how does it happen? Well, when you call upon the name of the Lord, if you're truly saved today, then the Bible says when you call out to God in prayer, the Holy Spirit comes in, he kills the old Jew, and he gives you Jesus. He gives you the heart of Christ. That's how Hebrews 13, 5 can say this. God has said to Christians, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Why? From the moment of salvation, Jesus Christ is with us. Yet like the disciples in Mark 6, most of us spend our days denying that miracle. Most of us, our hearts are so hard that we cannot let the miracle of Christ living in us and through us make a difference in our life. And that leads us to the truth, and the truth is this. We must practice the presence of Jesus to live in the sweet spot. If Tara's going to live in the sweet spot today, if she's going to live in the sweet spot tomorrow, then she must practice the presence of Jesus to live in the sweet spot. You're saying, Randy, what do you mean by presence? Well, all the way back from, to Exodus, the Bible says that one of God's goals is for his presence to be with us wherever we go. He says in Exodus 33, 14, the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Now, remember where they were. They were in the desert there was not a church for thousands of miles. They were in the worst possible place they could be, and yet the Bible said, what? My presence will go with you. I'll always be with you. And you're saying, well, Randy, well, that's old part of the Bible. Well, Jesus confirms it in Matthew 28, 20. He says, be sure of this, that I am always with you until the end of time. And so here's the thing. If you want to live free from sin... If you want to have the freedom to do good, if you got to live that way in the sweet spot, we must continually faith in the presence and the power of Jesus. Some of you right now, you're living defeated life. You want to live in victory? You want to live in victory over that enemy that lives right there in your home? You want to live in victory over the person that's against you at work? You want to live in victory over your baby daddy that continually tries to screw in your life? then you need to understand what Philippians 2.13 says and then live it out. God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. So if you want to live in the sweet spot, if you want to live an abundant life, if you want to bear much fruit, then the first thing we must do is we must remain in His presence. But there's a second thing we must do, and that is we must remain in Jesus' plan. We must remain in his plan. Go back to verse 6. He says, anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. What's he doing there? He's giving us the second step. The first step, we've got to remain in his presence. We've got to live like Jesus is with us wherever we go, whatever we do, even on Facebook. But the second thing we got to do is this. we got to stay close to Jesus. You're saying, Randy, how do I stay close to Jesus? We stay close to him by following his plan for our lives. You see, throughout the day, your job, you're saying, Randy, what's my job description? Your job is to put God's plan for your life into practice every day. But that leads us to this fact that aggravates the snot out of me. And that is most Christians are useless to God and others. Most Christians, that means you. Most Christians, that means me. Most of the time, we are useless to God and to others. You're saying, Randy, what do you mean? Well, I think of the story of the gifts in Matthew 25. Jesus tells this story. And you're saying, Randy, why do, why do I need to listen to a story for Jesus? Because he says it's going to happen to you one day. And he tells this story of a, of a master that was going on a long trip. And he gave three servants. He gave one servant five bags of silver. He gave another servant two bags of silver. He gave another servant one bag of silver. And, and, and he, this is what the master said. He said, hey, take this, these gifts I'm giving you, put them to use, be good stewards of them, because one day I'm coming back, and you're going to give an account to me of how you use the gifts I gave you. And so we, the, the, the servant with five bags of silver, you know what he did? 
He was smart. He went out to the, and he, he invested his five bags of silver. What does that mean today? He put it in the stock market. He played the stock market. And, he, and, and not too long after that, he took those five bags of silver, and he made another five bags of silver, and he had ten bags of silver. But the second servant, he wasn't smart enough to play the smart stock market. He didn't know how to do stuff like that. So what did he do? He knew if he, all he knew how to do was work hard. And so he took those two bags of silver, and he went out, and he worked his tail off. And he worked hard for his master. And not too long after that, those two bags of silver turned into another two bags of silver, and he had four. But then there was a third servant. And it seems like this servant fills the churches today. And the third servant says, you know what? My master's scary. He would get really mad at me if I lost my gift. And rather than going out and investing it, rather than going out and working with it, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to dig a hole, and I'm going to put the silver in it so that I won't lose it. He did nothing with his gift. And Jesus says that the master came back, and like you promised, he called the people together, and he said, all right, give it a count. And the one with five came up and said, Master, here's the five that you gave me, and I invested it, and I made five more. And the master said, well done, good and faithful servant. And the one with two bags, it wasn't as smart as the first one, but he worked hard. He said, Master, you gave me two bags. And I worked hard, and I made another two bags. Master, here's four bags. And the master patted him on the shoulder and said, well done, good and faithful servant. But then the third one came up. He said, Master, you scare me. I'm so scared. I didn't want to lose what you gave me. You know, the economy's been really bad lately. I didn't know what to do. I was just so scared. So, Master, what I did is I, I dug a hole and I did nothing with your gift. But here you go. Here's what you gave me. I'm giving you back what you gave me with nothing else added. And can I tell you something? Most, if not all of us, are that third servant. Don't think for one second you're the first two. I can look at your life and see your fruit. You're saying, Randy, who cares? God is love. He cares for me. He doesn't care if I'm scared. He doesn't care if I don't do anything with my... He doesn't care if there's nobody going to heaven because of me. He doesn't care if I'm wasting my talents. I'm waste. He doesn't care. Well, you might want to read with me what that master said. He said in Matthew 25, 26 to 28, he said, The master replied to the first servant who did nothing with his gift, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crop that I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my gift in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, Take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. You're saying, Why was he so mad? Because he didn't follow his plan for his life. God had a plan for this servant to take that one bag of silver and do something with it. You're saying, but Randy, why, why, why are you so mean? You do understand that God gave this man complete freedom within his plan. He could have invested it and still been well done, good and faithful servant. He could have worked with it. And still been well done, good faith. Jesus even said, hey, you can give it to somebody else and get a little interest on it. And you know what you'll get? Well done, good and faithful servant. There's plenty of freedom within the plan of God. Here's the thing. The only thing that makes us useless is when we do nothing with what God has given us. We do nothing with our children. We do nothing with our spouse. We do nothing with our work. We do nothing with our money. We do nothing with our bodies. We do nothing. That makes us useless. I don't believe that. Oh, you see, it's not me that's calling you wicked and lazy. You see, Randy, that's just a story. It doesn't matter. You do understand the Bible says one day every Christian's going to stand before the Lord and we're going to give an account for how we used our gifts. We're going to give an account for how we followed his plan for our lives. And if you and I continue to be useless and worthless and lazy and wicked, then we'll get what that servant gets. You're saying, Randy, I don't know about that. Are you trying to tell me you don't know what Jeremiah 29 11 says? 
You might not know the phrase, but you know Jeremiah 29 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and hope. You know that. You just simply refuse to do something with it. You see, you know God's plan for your salvation. You know God's plan for your marriage. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husband. You know God's plan for your children. Parents, discipline your children. Children, obey your parents. You know God's plan for your work. Employees, submit to your bosses. Bosses, love your employees. You know God's plan for church. Do not forsake the assembly of yourself together. You know God's plan for your money. Give 10 plus percent to him and his church and then give him the rest to do what he wants. You know God's plan for your body. You just refuse to do anything with it. That's why God calls you wicked. That's why God calls you lazy. And here's the thing. This is the thing that ought to scare the mess out of some of you because this is what he's telling you. He's getting ready to take what he's given you and give it to somebody else. He's getting ready to take your health and give it to somebody else. He's getting ready to take your wealth and give it to somebody else. He's getting ready to take that family and give it to somebody else. He's getting ready to take that marriage and give it to somebody else. And that leads us to this truth, and the truth is this. We must remember the harshness of God to live in the sweet spot. We must remember the harshness of God to live in the sweet spot. We must never forget Romans eleven twenty two. 22. It says, notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe to those who disobey, but kind to you if you continue to trust in this kindness. Guys, you've got to accept the truth about God's heart. And God's heart is kind, but God's heart is severe. You've got to accept that because until we fear him, we cannot be blessed. You're saying, Randy, why do you say that? Proverbs 14, 27. This ought to be somebody's refrigerator verse this week. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the grasp of death. You see, I don't know about you, but I was lied to. I was lied in Baptist churches, Methodist churches, Episcopalian churches, Catholic churches. I was lied at school. I was lied everywhere. Because this is how I was lied to. And maybe you were lied to, too, by your granny or your dad that doesn't know Jesus. Or maybe you were lied to like me. This is what I was lied to. I was told that fear didn't mean fear. That I was just supposed to respect God. I didn't have to fear him. I was just supposed to respect him, that God wouldn't want me to fear him. Well, guess what? I listened, and I bought it hook, line, and sinker. And you know what? I respected God. All the while, I'm having sex with every girl that could pull her pants down. I was, I was respecting God while I was lying and cheating at school. I was respecting God while I was disobeying my parents. I, was respe- I respected God as I blew off his church and defiled his name. I respected him. And still sin like an idiot. But one day, I got scared. It went from respect to fear. And guys, hear me. I know you think I'm mean. But the blessings that have come in my life as a result of fear of God that turned me from a life of sin have been too great to count. And so if we're going to live in the sweet spot, we've got to remain in his presence. If we're going to live in the sweet spot, we've got to remain in his plan, his plan for our families, his plan for our work, his plan. But the third thing, we've got to remain in Jesus' power. We've got to remain in his power. Go back to verses 5 and 7. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, that's talking, saying to his plan, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted what's he giving us there he's giving us the final step if you want to live in the sweet spot if you want to live the abundant life then guess what we got to access the power that God longs to give every Christian you do understand that right God is giving power away for free it ain't no it ain't no charge there ain't no conditions. He's giving his power away. You're saying, Randy, God don't want to give me power. Notice what Colossians 1.11 says. It says, God will strengthen Christians with his own great power. And that leads me to the most frustrating fact of all. And the most frustrating fact of all is most Christians act like helpless victims. Most Christians act like helpless victims. I think of the story of Jesus and the disciples in the storm in, in, in Matthew, chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 8. Jesus says, get in the boat. We're going to the other side. That should have been all they needed to hear. 
No matter what happened, Jesus said, get in the boat, we're going to the other side. Why are we worried? Why weren't they all climbed up with a pallet under their head and sleeping like Jesus? He said we were getting to the other side. But no, a storm came. Maybe a storm similar to what you're going through right now. Maybe a storm similar to what I'm going through right now. And a storm came. And these seasoned fishermen got scared. Not scared, scared. And this is what they did. They went, notice what it said, Matthew 8, 26. I mean, 8, 25. It said the disciples went and woke Jesus up. He was having a nap. Don't mess with me when I take a nap. He's having a nap. And he said, they, said, they went to Jesus woke him up and said, oh, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Now, what, he, what had he said to them? We're going to the other side. What were they saying to him? No, 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 no. We're going to drown. Now, how do you think Jesus responded to that? Now, if he was like you, he would cradle them in his bosoms and pat them on the back and say, you're awesome. You're great. You can do this. I believe in you. That's not what he did. Notice what Matthew 8, 26 said. It says, Jesus judged. Now, I know some of you are thinking, you're going, Randy, my Bible says Jesus replied. My Bible said Jesus says, well, if you look at the original language, by the way, the Bible wasn't written in English. If you look at the original language, the word replied, the word said, literally means judged. He judged what they were doing, and he judged them, and he said this, your faith is so small, why are you afraid? He was angry. He was mad. Why? Because he had just said in verse chapter 7, one chapter earlier, he had just said in Matthew 7, Ask and God will give it to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will open to you. Yes, everyone who asks will receive. Everyone who searches will find. And everyone who knocks will have the door open. Your heavenly Father will give good things to those who ask him. What was he doing? He just gave them permission to ask for and receive miracles. What they do? They didn't do it. They didn't believe him. They were acting helpless and hopeless. And oh, are we the same way. Do I want to be with you tomorrow around 3 o'clock? Well, you know, when life doesn't go the way you expect it to. Your children don't obey like they should. Your grandchildren let you down one more time, even though they're sitting beside you in church today. Do I want to be with you? Do I want to watch you act like a helpless, hopeless victim? Well, I can't do it. I can't do anything. We're calling our friends. We're getting on Facebook. Oh, I'm so, we're getting on Instagram. We're posting some stupid quote. Acting like helpless and hopeless victims. I, I think of Ephesians 3.20. If you've been to this church for more than a year, you've heard me probably say this verse to you 20 times. Well, let me read it to you one more time. Maybe this is your first Sunday. Ephesians 3.20 says this. God is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. We know that. If you didn't, you know it now. We know that verse, and yet we don't think we can discipline our kids. We know that, but we don't think that we can forgive our enemies even if we're married to them. We know that, yet we don't think we can say no to the second helping of dessert. We're hopeless. We're helpless victims. And so maybe today, I don't know about you, but I'm so sick of being a pansy. I'm so sick of praying pansy prayers. Oh, God, help me. Instead of saying, God, give me the desire and the power to whoop my son's flesh. God, give me the desire and the power to whoop my church member's rebellion. God, give me the desire and the power to say no to one more bowl of ice cream. God, give me the desire. Stop asking for help and start praying for power. And that leads us to the truth. And the truth is this. We must access the power of God to live in the sweet spot. 
We must access the power of God to live in the sweet spot. 1 Corinthians 4.20 says this, The Christian life is not just a lot of talk. It is living by God's power. Oh, gosh, guys. That verse, should you should be running to the altar right now. Because on your best days, most if not all of us, all we do is talk about Jesus. There's no power. We walk around here, we struggle. Randy, I'm just struggling. You do realize the word struggle is code for you saying, I want to sin, but I don't want you to say anything to me about it. Christians don't struggle. We kill it. We move on. We deal with it. We move on. We don't struggle. And so the, he's saying that real Christianity isn't just telling people that Jesus is with you. It's living like his power is on you. Uh, let me give you three verses that would, if you put these verses to practice, they would reveal the power of God in your family, in your community, at your work, in your neighborhood. It would reveal the power of God like never before. Let me give you three verses. James 1.9 says this, Christians must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. That might take a little power. What do you think? He goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. When you go to the restaurant, do you make God look good? That might take a little power, right? And here's one that messes with me the most. Ephesians 4, 32. Mm. Be kind. Oof. <laughs> you can't tell. I don't wake up that way. But then he keeps going. Tenderhearted. You know what that means? When somebody's crying, you cry with them because you're, you're tenderhearted. When somebody's happy, you're happy with them. When somebody's mad, you're mad with them. As long as they're righteous anger. You're tenderhearted. And then he keeps going, oh, forgiving one another just as God through Christ forgave you. Would that show the power of God in your marriage? Would that show the power of God to your children? For you to be slow to speak and quick to hear? Where do we get that power? Well, we already know it's living in us, right? Why? Because Jesus is living in us if you're saved. But how do we get that power? Well, notice what Ephesians 1, 20, 19 and 20 says. Pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. The same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead can help you stop being fat. The same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead can stop you from gossiping. The same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead can stop you from craving those stupid, idiotic, brain-numb drugs. The same power that raised Christ from the dead can cleanse the porn off your phone. The same power that raised Christ from the dead can defeat your children and your grandchildren's sin nature and bring them to the cross. The same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead is available to us through prayer. Are you ready to pray? Because I sure am. Bow your heads, close your eyes, every head bowed. Every eye proves. Guys, I, I just want God's best for you. I want you to live the abundant, sweet spot, fruitful life. Not just one day out of 50, but every day. But what? It, we got to remain in His presence. We got to follow His plan. So my question for you is this. Have you followed God's plan for your salvation? Don't blow me off here because right now God's told me that one of my sons in the faith thinks he's saved and he's not. He's missed God's plan for his life, for his salvation. And maybe that's you, father. Maybe that's you, wife. Maybe that's you. You think you're saved, but you've missed God's plan for your life. And you're saying, Randy, how does your son miss it? This is what he thinks. My son in the faith, he thinks that salvation is God making bad people good. And that is not it. You want to know how I know he believes that? 
Because he wakes up every day trying. 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 His prayer life is, is, is full of help me, help me, help me. If your prayer life is help me, help me, help me, your prayer life's about you. You do get that salvation is not about making bad people good. It's about bringing dead people to life. You want to know why you can't do good? Because you're dead. You're a zombie. You're dead spiritually. And there is no power within you to do good. That's why you're so frustrated. That's why you keep failing. Because you are not saved. And I know you've tried. That son of faith of mine, he's tried several times to get saved, but he keeps trying to get saved according to his plan instead of God's plan. Are you ready to do it God's way? I can't make you do it. If I could, I would. Trust me. But I can pray for you. Let me pray for you right now. Dear God, I lift up all those here who think they're saved and they're not. I lift up my child of faith. Help us, Lord, not to do anything on our own, but bring us to our senses and make us realize that you have no desire to make a bad person good. You want to bring us to life. And Lord, if we've never acknowledged to you that we're dead, if we've never acknowledged to you that we're worthless and helpless and hopeless, then, God, we are not saved. Christ is not living in us, and we have no hope for glory. Lord, be with the ones here that think they're saved and they're not. Lord, lead them to somebody to talk to. They don't have to talk to me. Let them talk to somebody, Lord God, that they've seen the fruit of salvation in their life. And, Lord, prepare those of us who are, they're going to go to and they're going to talk to. Lord, give us the desire and the power to clearly articulate the gospel to them. Lord, this sermon has been for Christians. And there may be some in here today. If there are, Lord God, be with the rest of this invitation. Lord, may we no longer fail you like we have. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.